In the last video, I started the build for a ZX Spectrum which uses the Z80 CPU, but instead of an uncommitted logic array, the plan is to use an EEPROM to generate the video signal. This is the overall architecture. Last time I managed to get the CPU to operate at low speed, but I haven't tested the video circuit and the CPU at video speeds. The static RAMs that I'm using are much faster than the dynamic RAM of the original Spectrum, so I can use a different technique for multiplexing the CPU access and the video access to the memory. The Spectrum operates on 16 pixels at a time. The first 12 pixel clocks are taken up with accessing the video and attribute data, while the CPU has access for 4 clocks in the 16 pixel block. I'm planning a different approach. When the clock bar signal going into the Z80 is high, the Z80 has access to the static RAM. When the clock bar signal is low, the raster generator has access to the static RAM. The trick to making this work is this 74HC374, which stores the read data to present to the Z80 at the right time. Now I want to look at the video side of things. Before I talk about the raster generator, which creates the timing for the video signals, I need to talk about how computers generate video signals. I've used this graphic in a number of videos, so if you've seen this before, you might want to skip over the next minute or two. To understand how raster generators work, we need to go back to cathode ray tube technology. There's an electron gun at the back of the tube, which generates free electrons when heated, and these are accelerated towards the front of the screen. At the front of the tube, we have three different types of phosphor. These glow either red, green or blue when they absorb the energy from the electrons. On the side of the tube, we have some electromagnets and some clever analog electronics inside the display uses these electromagnets to sweep the beam from left to right and top to bottom. We call this sweeping pattern a raster scan. Another feature of the cathode ray tube is that we have the ability to turn the electron beam on and off very quickly. In computers, this on and off pattern is coordinated with a dot clock. When viewed from the front, we sweep through the pattern and we turn the electron beam on and off so it makes the picture. We build this picture one line at a time, and each of these lines is called a scan line. The flyback at the end of each scan line is controlled by a signal called horizontal sync. We gradually go down the image, then when we finally hit the bottom right, another signal called vertical sync takes the beam back up to the top left. We use a counter to keep track of where we are in a scan line and when to generate the horizontal sync signal. Now, the ZX80 and ZX81 cleverly use the refresh register inside the Z80 for this counter, but that's the exception rather than the rule. To start with, I'm going to look at how, in general terms, the Apple II generates its video signal. I go over this in greater detail in videos 8 through 11 of the Apple II wire by wire series on this channel, but I'll summarize it briefly here. We start with our master clock, which is 14.318 MHz in the Apple II, and we feed this into a counter, and we first tap off the pixel clock, which will be 7.159 MHz. Normally, a counter like this will divide by 16, but the Apple II only has 7 pixels per character. So we want this counter to divide by 14 rather than 16. We can do this pretty easily with the 3 input AND gate, which resets the counter. Once the counter's at 13 and it gets a clock, it'll briefly go to 14, but then the AND gate will detect it and reset the counter, and the 14 will go back to being a 0. Apart from this very short period, the counter goes from 0 to 13. Next, we need to count out 65 characters per scan line. We use another counter with an AND gate, but this time the AND gate detects the value 65 and resets the counter, so the right hand counter goes from 0 to 64. This means on the Apple II, there are 65 times 7 pixels per scan line, which is 455 pixels in total very close to the number we want to achieve for the ZX Spectrum. The output from the counter feeds into the video memory system and points to the character within the current scan line to be displayed. We can pull off the horizontal sync signal, which is asserted for counts 48 through 51, and the horizontal blank signal, which is asserted for counts over 40. 
that's the horizontal part of the raster counter. And now we can tap off a line clock signal which goes to the next stage of the counter which handles the vertical count. The Apple II is NTSC based, so it has 262 scan lines. So we need a 9-bit counter for this. And again, we can use an AND gate to detect 262, which is used to reset the counter. This means the vertical counter goes from 0 to 261. We can use a NAND gate to generate the vertical sync signal, which will be asserted for scan lines 224 to 239. Next, we have some more logic, which asserts the vertical blank signal when the count's over 191. The vertical count also goes to the video memory system. This works just fine, but it results in a lot of different chips being used. Here, this circuit's being used to display Pac-Man from that video series. The Apple II uses a chain of 74LS161s, which are 4-bit binary up counters. When the inputs are set correctly, on the positive edge of clock, the binary output is incremented by 1. These can be cascaded to form larger counters, 8 bits in this case, but they can be made arbitrarily large. I've made a breadboard with two 74LS161s connected up to some LEDs. Here we can see it counting up. Note the binary pattern. If we look at the block diagram for this 74LS161, there's quite a bit of hidden detail. I want to generate a counter using simpler logic, but I'll keep this set of four flip-flops connected to a common clock. For the rest, I'll use a set of half adders to increase the count. This is a half adder. It has two inputs as well as a sum and carry output. When the A and B inputs are low, the sum output's low and the carry output's low. When A or B are high, but not both, the sum output's 1 and carry 0. Finally, when both inputs are high, the sum's 2, but the output has to be in binary, so the sum output's low and carries high. To form a counter, first we connect up the carry out from one half adder to one of the inputs of the next half adder. The output from all the half adders goes into a set of flip flops, and the output from the flip flops goes back to the half adders. Let's say we have a number stored in the flip flops, 2b hexadecimal for example. These feed into the adders, its function is to add 1, so in this case the output of the adders will be 2c. On the next positive edge of clock, the 2C is stored in the flip-flops and presented on the outputs. A short time later, the output from the adders will increase to 2D. I've built a circuit that does exactly this, and we can see it here implemented on breadboard. The main thing to notice is that it's generating exactly the same sequence of binary numbers as the 74LS161 counters. Now, we can think of this circuit in a slightly different way. We have a set of flip-flops, but all of these gates can be thought of as being a cloud of logic. It has eight inputs, well, nine if you count carry, but carry is always set, and eight outputs. We call this combinatorial logic because the output is purely based on the input and nothing else. Any given input always produces the same output. When we configure a circuit in this way, it forms a structure known as a finite state machine, which I would argue is one of the most important elements of all computers. Now, we know there are other devices that can take eight inputs and give eight outputs, where each output is derived purely from the input. An EEPROM is an example, and this EEPROM is being programmed to take the place of the chain of half adders. To demonstrate this, I've built a third circuit where I use an EEPROM and an octal D type flip flop. Again, notice that the EEPROM based solution is producing exactly the same sequence as before. One of the cool things about using an EEPROM is that it's programmable, so we can easily change the pattern if we want to. One nice thing about using an EEPROM is that all the combinatorial logic used to make a raster generator can be stored in the EEPROM. Alright, let's get back to the current machine. To start off with, I'm going to produce a monochrome PAL signal for testing, and I'll eventually transition to standard colour VGA for use. Most computers of the era used a modified version of PAL, which updates at 50 frames per second with a progressive scan. 
let's compare PAL and VGA. The dot clock's actually a little negotiable. The PAL dot clock is 7 MHz on the spectrum, and I need a dot clock of 14 MHz for VGA. But the sync frequency for PAL is 15,625 Hz, and for VGA, it's 31,500 Hz at 60 frames per second progressive. The number of scan lines in PAL is 312, and in VGA it's 525. I know that the 60 frames per second of VGA might cause some problems, because many games expect a 50Hz update, but I'll come back and revisit this again later. Now, I have a bit of a problem here. I don't actually have a 14MHz crystal, or even a 28MHz crystal that I can divide by 2. What I do have is a 28.636MHz oscillator, and I can use that to make a 14.318MHz signal. Alright, so how do we generate the raster scan using an EEPROM? We do this by configuring the EEPROM to form a finite state machine. I wire the 16-bit output from the EEPROM directly to a pair of 74HC374 octal D-type flip-flops. I actually wired all this up in the last video. Now here's the tricky bit for some. I wire the output of the flip-flops back to the address inputs of the EEPROM. This allows us to jump from one address to another address on each clock cycle, and we have complete control over the sequence. Right, let's get a little more specific for the spectrum with PAL. Every EEPROM location refers to eight contiguous pixels within the display. I'll refer to these as a character, because for standard text, this aligns with the characters on the display, but this isn't a completely accurate description. The active area is 32 by 192 EEPROM memory locations, which I'll map to location 0 hexadecimal in the EEPROM. I'm going to set enough space aside in the inactive area to cover the entire display, so many of the assigned addresses won't be used. I'll map this to location 4000 hex, and finally, we have the sync region, which I'll map to F1000 hex. Address 0 is in the active area, it points to address 1, address 1 points to address 2, and so on. This continues until we get to location 31, or 1 f hexadecimal, which is the right edge of the active display. From here, we want to point into the border region. We skip through the border region until we hit the end of the scan line, and we jump to the next active scan line. We repeat this again and again until we hit the bottom of the screen, where we're completely within the border region. I haven't shown the sync signals here, but they're mixed in there as well. Once we get to the bottom right, we start a new frame at the top left. Note that the first active scan line starts at 0 hexadecimal, but the second scan line starts at location 100 hex. Now, this may seem a little odd until we look at the video memory mapping that the ZX Spectrum uses. The lower three bits of the vertical address, V0 through V2, are swapped with the next set of three addresses, V3 through V5. I'm not completely sure why they did this. Well, who do you suggest we play? Factor! This is a small home computer. You press that button. It's probably not actually her fault. I can use this piece of code to calculate an address from the character's row and column locations. I won't go over it in detail here, but you can pause the video and look at it more carefully if you like. Then, to generate the EEPROM, I sweep through all the columns and rows, find the address of this character and the one after it, and program that into the EEPROM. I can test the scan order in software before I burn it into the EEPROM. Red's active, green's inactive, and black is the sync signal. Each scan line is cleared immediately before it's drawn, so we can see the scan. In RAM, the first scan line starts at 4000, and the second scan line starts at 4100. This means we're going to need a mapping between the EEPROM address and the ZX Spectrum RAM address, but I'll worry about that later. For now, I just want to see if I can generate any video signal. We scoot through the EEPROM, in the order of the lower 13 bits of the video address. We can use a simple OR gate to detect the active area, and an AND gate for the sync signal. To drive the PAL composite output, I'm going to use the emitter follower circuit designed by Steve Wozniak for the Apple II. 
I've divided the 28.6 MHz signal by 32, and this is used to clock the finite state machine. Okay, let's see if I can get this to work. I'm going to exclusively all H3 and V3 to drive the video circuit for the composite output. Let's hook it up, and we get this checkerboard pattern, which is what we'd expect. Let's have a look at where we are. We've made a raster generator which can generate PAL signals that a monitor can lock onto. Excellent! Okay, but now for the big test. Can we read from the same memory that the CPU uses? Now, the lower 8 bits of the video address map directly to the lower 8 bits of the spectrum address. We can connect CPU clock bar to the output enable of the lower octal D-type flip-flop, so it'll drive the lower 8 bits of the address bar while clock bar is low. The upper 8 bits are a bit more complicated. I'm going to use some 2 to 1 multiplexers to swap between the bitmap buffer address and the attribute buffer address. The 74HC257 has an output enable, so if we connect clock bar to these, the multiplexers will drive the upper 8 bits while clock bar is low. I've wired the input to the multiplexers, so the bitmap buffer will go from 4000 to 57FF hex. And the attribute buffer will go from 5800 to 5AFF hex. The attribute address ignores the vertical count V0 through V2, which is the line count. For a given EEPROM address, we do two memory fetches using the same address. We need to do a bitmask read, then we do an attribute read, and we use these multiplexers to flip between the bitmap address space from 4000 hex and the attribute address space from 5800 hex. It's only these upper 8 bits of the address that we need to modify to switch between the bitmap and the attribute buffers. I've included the build in these videos to show how the theory feeds directly into the building of the machine. I know there are a number of ZX Spectrum clones, but I wanted to provide a detailed description of how this one works. Alright, I'm nearly done wiring in these 74HC257 multiplexers. Now that we've read the memory contents, we need to serialize the bitmap buffer byte. I've drawn the bitmask capture device here as a single octal D-type flip-flop, but in fact, I need two registers. One to capture the bitmask, and another to capture the attribute value. The output from the bitmask register goes directly into a 74HC166, which serializes the stream. I'll talk about how we generate color using the attribute in the next video. Unfortunately, I don't seem to have recorded this part of the build. All right, let's end the output of the shift register with the active signal and send it to the composite video circuit. Finally, I want to go over the clock. We have the 28.636 MHz signal. I divide it by 2, then feed this into a 74HC161 counter like we saw before. I feed the output of the counter into a 74HC374, which may seem a little odd at first, but what it means is I have time to invert the signals and perform other operations, and all the clock signals will be completely in phase. Here's the final trick. The 74HC161 has a signal called terminal count out. This goes high when the count's at 15. If I invert this signal, I can use it as the load signal for the 74HC166 shift register. This loads the bitmap at exactly the right time. In this case, with the PAL timing, the CPU is clocked at 1.75 MHz, so we'll see if we can get that working first. And now we're at the important bit. Does the 74HC374 keep the Z80 happy while the video circuit's accessing the SRAM at speed? Let's see. And success. The CPU is generating the welcome text and the video circuit's displaying it. This is a major milestone. I think I'll leave this video here for now, and we'll try and get VGA working in the next video.